You're listening to Patch Bay on TYM KRS. Welcome to Patch Bay, a conversational podcast all about audio equipment, music, audio engineering, recording, music production, live sound, video game music sometime. Uh, yeah, that's been, uh, that uh, seems like it's a topic that keeps coming back up, Shane. It has been, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying it, though. Just, well, from everybody has gathered, I'm not haven't got into it as much as I'd like. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite enjoying having the, the uh, game audio discussion as well as some of the research I've been doing lately. <clears throat> so, so what's been up, dude? Um, well, basically, I this week has been very, very busy. I'm trying to work ahead and get all the shows um, pre-produced and uploaded and queued in advance so that I have some extra time to do some other things. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got my piano, my upright, which is, uh, uh, Adam Schaefe, 1914, um, uh, full-sized upright piano. Uh, but, uh, uh, somebody went through it and, uh, redid all the keys and they did, uh, they took all the, uh, player piano bits out of it. It's, it's a really big case because oh. it's a player piano. Um, so, um... It's it's got some issues like the soundboard is cracked and um, the it still has all the original hammers and felt and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. on the inside. But this year, it's actually gotten to the point where it's not really playable because of humidity. It's pushed and pulled um, the the keys in the bed enough to the side that some of them are sticking. Oh, that's never fun. <laughs> um, yeah, it, 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 pianos really suffer from that, too. Well, any acoustic instrument will suffer from the changes in the weather and stuff like that, but they, they tend to really... Uh, there's a few the few times I've recorded real pianos, um, they, they tend to, even over the course of a week, they'll tend to go quite out of tune compared to the way they were in the, in the first place. And if you're moving them and stuff like that, it's... Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. It sucks that the keys are sticking together, though. That's yeah. uh, that's a lot of work. I can I can live with it being a little out of tune. You know, I don't use it for recording really, more for you know composing. And as long as it's somewhat in tune with itself, it works fine for that job. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But when it starts to have mechanical problems like that, then I'm yeah. I I actually <laughs> use the thing all the time for uh, uh-huh. coming up with progressions and melodies and stuff. Um, just because it's not a recording tool doesn't mean it's not a useful tool in the studio. So right now oh, yeah. my living room is just absolutely covered in bits and pieces of piano. Oh, geez. <laughs> so uh, despite the fact that you're already busy, you decide to rip the piano apart. Yeah, and <laughs> it's just one of them that needs to be fixed. I mean, my uh, Wurlitzer uh, 206A electric piano needs its uh, regulation to be adjusted because... When you press the keys, you got to press them really hard for it to even thwack the tines. Oh, so, right. You know, that needs work too. And gosh, That's tweakery. I, I don't even yeah. know when I'm going to get to it. Well, guitars tend to... Well, not all guitars, but at least the electrics that I've had seem to sort of stay where they're supposed to, um, other than switches and, and pots and stuff like that. I had an interesting occurrence last week, actually, speaking of that... Uh, <clears throat> One of the guys in my band has a Godin guitar. Have you ever seen them? No. No? It's Canadian make. Um, and they're fairly high-end, expensive guitars. And they they, they wire um, a MIDI pickup in them. They usually have, well, his has two humbuckers, uh, the MIDI out, plus a Pezio on the bridge, too. So you can pretty much pull anything you want out of that guitar as far as sounds are concerned, you know? And... Um, we were actually picking up an AM radio station with it, and it had in its in its humbuckers, which was was kind of, you know, that usually you would think that would be the last guitar that you'd be picking something like that up on. But uh, I found out after the fact they were active humbuckers, so more gain, yada yada yada, right? Yeah. But uh, it was kind of interesting. It was very um, uh, the start of the song called "Silver F" by uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. There's a there's a bit. In there at the start of the song, that's a sample from a radio, which I'm pretty sure came out of an amp. But anyway, that was uh, it's kind of interesting. They're neat guitars, actually. If you check them out, it's G O D I N. But anyway, um, so I, well, I was going to talk about that little guitar thing that I did, but um, this week while I was recording, but 
were you still wanting to discuss the piano? Um, I really haven't got into it enough to have much to talk about. Um, it's just been yeah. a disassembly so far, and I've got um, uh, one of the listeners to many of our shows, uh, Dino uh, from Hackaweek, uh, dot com, I think is his website, um, donated this epic piano repair book um, last oh, cool. year, and it's just been sitting on the piano since waiting for me to have time to actually start ripping into the thing and redoing mm-hmm. stuff. So I think I've got a, a few tools that I'm going to have to order. Um, yeah, there are specific tools for that. Yeah. Yeah. I've already I've got never... the hide glue and in, in stuff, so it's not going to be too bad, but there's some, yeah. there's some tools I don't have that I'm going to need. I was going to ask that this book, is it just how to repair pianos as in just pianos or how to repair the specific piano that you have? Pianos in general. In general. Okay. Yeah. That is, that's cool. That's, that's, that, it's nice to have uh, a starting point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and this is the kind it, of book where everybody that I've ever talked to has pointed at that as like the go-to for this kind of thing. So I, I think yeah. I'll be in good hands with it. We'll see. That reminds me of the Yamaha Live Sound Engineer book. That seems to be the book that most live sound guys, at least everybody I've talked to, has at least read that one and then sort of thrown that out and went their own way. But but at least had read that one anyway. It's uh, something along that lines. A Live Sound Engineer handbook. Um, it's kind of interesting stuff. Anyway, so um, this week I was tracking some guitars with a heavy metal band. And it was the same band from before, but we were retracking some, doing some extraneous stuff. And the, the guy had brought in a, uh, I think it was a 4x12 Marshall um, valve state head sort of situation. And um, I don't know if you ever really mic'd a 4x12 before. I don't think so, no. What I've read often is that you should try and pick a speaker instead of like miking all four or miking two of them just from phase issues and stuff like that. So that's what I've always kind of gone with was sort of put my head close to the app and decide which speaker I was going to mic and usually go for my, uh, <clears throat> I have two or three different variations on a miking technique they use for guitar amps. Yeah, but that makes sense. Cause with more than one <clears throat> sound source at different physical lengths from the microphone, you yeah. can get in a comb filter sort of stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, I know two 57s are made the same and, and no two speakers are made the same. I mean, you know, uh, maybe certain speakers are more beat up than other ones or whatever the case is, right? You're never going to get exactly the same tone out of it. So that's why I've always kind of gone with as far as miking's concerned. I mean, if you want it stereo, let's track it twice, kind of. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or or use two different mics and pan them hard or whatever. Um, so I did the the usual thing that I did. And then I also, it was an open back or half open back. And um, so I did the old speaker in the back, reverse the phase, or mic in the back, reverse the phase thing, uh, which I didn't end up keeping but yeah because that would create comb filter definitely well no but i mean if it's phase reversed and it's even with it phase reversed because the distances from the the speaker are different no this is true when you put the waves over the top of each other you get this filter that is applied and then not and then applied and then not you can use it for some really cool effects actually yeah exactly um I ended, I didn't end up using it anyway, but because um, it just sounded bad. It, well, no, it was actually what the case was. I was going to just either use that or use the ones in the front, not both. So, <clears throat> and compared to the ones in the front, I li- I liked the ones in the front better. But gotcha. Uh, so, anyway, long story short, Les Paul through Marshall L thick, like super duper ridiculously thick um but at the time and and this is where sometimes even if you're going with your gut it doesn't always work out um i thought it was i thought it sounded fine like it was cutting but there was meat and yada 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 upon uh the listen the next day there was not really enough bite in mid-range to like it's still a heavy tune but it needed you know 
some more, uh, you know, if you've got a humbucker going through a four by 12, it's, it's going to be thick, right? But um, depending on the amp settings and stuff like that, you can't always EQ that in after the fact, you know, if you're missing it um, without really sacrificing something else. So what we ended up doing, are you following me? Yeah. Yeah. So what we ended up doing was retracking. It was just rhythm part, but what we ended up doing was retracking the rhythm part um, through my Fender uh, Superchamp and uh, just just on a sort of a more brighter, still thick sort of metal kind of distortion, but a little bit brighter and, and using a different, the guy was still using his guitar, but a different pickup. I think he was using the bridge or something like that. Played the exact same riffs, the whole nine yards, and then in the mix ended up using like the beefy one I had a problem with, but just this new track just to accentuate that higher end that was missing on the on the uh, original track. Um, so it worked out actually quite well. Kind of a different way of doing things, you know? Yeah, it makes sense, though. Um, well, it's problem solving. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, rather yeah. than trying to EQ it to get what you want, you just create another copy through a different uh, signal chain and layer them and... You can it turn it up really... or down to, you know, say how much of that you want to affect it. Yeah, it was is really like the tone control feel to it, right? Like it, um, you know, and, and oftentimes in the studio, some engineers will record the DI signal for insurance policies to do stuff like that. Yeah, and then reamp. Uh, yeah, and it, every time I've reamped, it, it's never quite right. <laughs> um, but at this way, at least it was another version of the guy playing but it wasn't the you know 64 rhythm guitar parts doing the same thing it was just you know um solving a problem and uh you know i'm I'm sure you could do that with um specific you know drums if you wanted to maybe not a whole kit and a whole playing but um obviously with digital technology you could just you know take a snapshot and paste it kind of but um yeah i have done some of that kind of stuff in the past and uh, thankfully, the guy was cool with it, and it just it made a huge difference in the overall. It just had a, enough bite because sometimes, a lot of times with really heavy music like that, there's so much stuff occupying the low end that that it can be really difficult to get any kind of the production feel out of it. You know? Yeah, and when you get into those uh, low mids and uh, upper bass frequencies, basically, I music genres that try to take heavy advantage of that area almost shoot themselves in the foot because the human ear isn't very good nor is our recording technology honestly very mm. good at having more than one thing going on in that space at the same time uh, yeah. when i'm composing music i always try to give especially in the low range i try to give everything its own frequency range to live mm. in yeah and, and the thing about metal too is that you know, in a live atmosphere, it's it's quantitatively different, but to try and capture it on a recording, you're never going to get it as brutal sounding as it is live. But, <laughs> um, you know, because it, it's sterilized to a degree, um, I, I tend to try and I usually try to approach those records as sort of the like trashy, thrashy kind of sounding like roomy sort of sounding stuff rather than it's sounding a bit more produced because it, it is difficult. Like the one, one band that sort of sticks out for me as far as, uh, doing it the right way was corn. Like as far as like, <clears throat> you know, with the bass guitar, the guy had, they mic'd him when he was playing bass and they mic'd his just the, to get the guitar noise and the slap of the fingers and stuff like that. And it really got incorporated into, you know, the overall sort of picture, right? <clears throat> So they they were really good about, you know, having extremely bright symbols and things like that so that it, it, it still felt like there was a, a range <laughs> of sound that you were listening to and not just just like low end kind of schmozzle, as it were. Yeah, there's a lot of frequency there. Use it all. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. And I mean, the thing is, uh, I... I, I a lot of guys don't always catch it, but you know they'll, they'll walk in. They want like their guitar to be as thick as possible. But the thing is, like, 
it's the bass really that does it, <laughs> you know, like the actual bass guitar. Um, if you have a super thick guitar, it's not really doing anybody any good, really. Yeah, like it's if making you look, the bass sound muddier and making the yeah. drums harder to get through. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> you know, if you if you go in and you mute, like if you you listen to a heavy track and then you mute the bass guitar or mute and mute the dr- the kick drum, you know, everything sort of, or at least for me, it. it does not so much become telephony, but you, you obviously there's root notes being borrowed <laughs> from the bass guitar sound. You know? Yeah, so totally. If, if you set it up the right way, um, you know, and and not always. Well, you should listen to the musicians, but you shouldn't always go with every single idea that they have. <laughs> I guess is what you know. I mean, you when don't their ideas to... counteract how physics works, then yeah. you know then uh, I, I think i would probably go um actually fellas <laughs> this is the correct way to do it uh well this is the good thing about um when you record stuff live to tape or live to pro tools or whatever but you, you don't pre-eq it so you can put a roll off on the eq you know and sort of carve your mix and um if they if they want it all muddy and messy then you know, just hit bypass on the EQ, you know what I mean? But uh, speaking of which, that's another thing that just sort of popped into my brain. I remember when I was going to school, um, there was a the, the studio that I was going to school at. There was a, an, another actual pro studio next door. And there was like these two engineer guys that worked there. And there was one who was sort of like the older kind of engineer dude that had been around for a while. And there was sort of this young buck guy. And I remember... Uh, we were standing outside or whatever, and um, the older guy was hanging out with us, and then this young guy comes out, and he's like, man, you got to come listen to this mix, and he like kind of calls us all in or whatever. And I did this whole mix without any EQ. I, I like made a point of not touching it or whatever, and, and the old guy, uh, he sort of says to him, he's like, well, yeah, like, yeah, it's a good mix, you know, but had the whole reason of not using any EQ – you know, that's a cool thing, but I mean, if you listen to it, like really listen to it, there's elements that could still use a little bit of it. You know what I mean? Um, it was just kind of a funny little thing. And it wasn't, he wasn't giving the guy hell for not using it or whatever the case, but just that, you know, if you paint yourself in a corner to say, I'm not ever going to use this thing, you, you know, you, you sort of, you're, you're, you're painting yourself in a corner, right? It's just kind of a thing that just popped into my brain. Yeah. Um, one thing that I find is extremely useful, um, even if an instrument is not necessarily sitting in the exact space that you want using EQs or filters especially, um, mm-hmm. bandpass filters, high-pass filters, low-pass filters, uh, to get it exactly where you want it, is one of the most powerful tools for making it so that you can have more elements there doing their job mm-hmm. and absolutely not interfering with one another. You can pick out and hear every single piece of it clearly. And I think that's uh, really important. Yeah, no, exactly. And speaking to that, more often than not, I'm not usually reaching for parametric. I mean, I, I do, um, but... I tend to sort of do not broad as in lots of EQ um, or a lot of DB of adjustments, but I, I tend to sort of stick with um, roll offs and um, and the you know and the bell curve kind of EQs. I mean, it really does depend on that. There's certain things, but for your sort of rhythmic kind of instruments, I'll tend to just sort of you know, sort of stick to that. Like I have a specific thing that I usually try and go for on the kick and it usually requires a little bit of parametric depending on how I set it up in the first place. But um, you know, when you get into those really tweaky bands, like where, you, you know, the cue is like so insignificant. Um, it's funny, a lot of guys will do that with EQ on digital EQ because they can see it. <laughs> Uh, you know, visually see what they're doing. and Because, you know, that, we watch music. We don't listen. Yeah, but, like, I grew up on a console, and 
the, the, the cues on those things, a lot of the times were like preset, you know, and, and on some of the Mackie boards, it was like, a, it was a huge sweep. Like if you added high end, you're adding high end, like, you know, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't like a light version of it, you know, on that Soundcraft app work, it has a variable low, low and high shelving, which is, and variable roll off, which is really slick. Um, but if you actually took a snapshot of what you were doing on a console EQ and actually looked at it graphically, um, it would probably freak out a lot of guys because a lot of the times these guys, and what I've found is they go a lot less than what would actually it would actually be if they were using a like if you if you took a snapshot of what they would do on a on an EQ on a console, but uh, it, it's just me, I guess. I, I don't know, but yeah, it's it, it mixing and looking at something is never a smart idea, yeah. <laughs> and using presets either is not normally. It's a good starting point, but I think but, it depends on who you are. Um, yeah, yeah. If, uh, especially those of us who grew up on analog consoles, um, we had to learn to use our ears above our eyes first. Yeah. So they're already trained up. So when you give us a tool where we can actually see it, yeah, uh, a lot of us are you know wise enough to adjust it until our ears like it, and then look at the curve and remember that curve for later, right? Yeah. Rather than yeah. looking at the curve and letting that make the decision up front. Yeah, letting the curve. Well, and, and it, what I was getting at with the shelving too is that somebody might go, "Oh, wow, you know that's like plus six, uh, you know, ten k." Uh, sh- you know, high end shelving I'm doing, and um, they might go, oh well, I, mean, I shouldn't do that, you know, because it, obviously that that's too much. Uh, but you know, if if it sounds good, just go with it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I used to do that all the time on, on consoles, especially if you were dealing with you know like a tape transfer that was coming back and was moldy. You needed to try and restore some high end when, it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, other than the hiss, obviously. But, so um, yeah. I think that that's kind of why I brought up the filter thing rather than a uh, typical multi-band EQ or parametric EQ or something like that. Because when you, when you attack it with a filter, you are your curve is very steep typically. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're not even pretending like you're going in there gently. You're just going in with a brute force tool that mm-hmm. kills everything that you don't want off of there. And just totally takes off any of the, oh, let's say harmonic content, for example. It's gone. What I remember this one engineer I used to um, know. He he would he would he really prescribed to the idea of slotting, which basically he'd roll off any information that wasn't really needed on a lot of sources. Um, and his typical was 120. Um, so, you know, he'd get a really great mix of like sort of the low end elements and there wouldn't be much mud and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, he'd slot out guitars and vocals and and things like that. So you end up with a, a very balanced sort of audiophile kind of mix where everything um you know the base is there and, and, and this kind. But then if you listen to it like as a as a side note, it's like yeah, but there's you know the, the, the there's no low end on the, like there's no oomph on the vocal at all you know yeah so the slotting some is things a have a lot idea. of harmonic content that you don't want to roll off um, right for example with a guitar if you roll off the high end on a guitar you know the 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 very high end that we think you know humans can't even hear that high end we can hear that you know it, oh, yeah. we we may not be able to hear it but we can feel it it's where you get the you know, the open feeling of it being in a space. You know, if you roll that off of an acoustic guitar, you're going to mess it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and speaking to that, too, I remember doing, a, I was EQing a vocal on um, one of my band's tracks from prior to when I was in the band, but um, I had sort of a very pop kind of mix and EQ sort of scheme going on, and I was really working hard on on trying to get the vocal to to really feel right. Like it, it felt like the way she'd recorded it, but just to make it feel right. And, uh, and she was sitting there and cause she, she knows her voice. Yeah. I rolled out a little bit of low end here and there to make room for balancing things, you know? And, um, 
And I was kind of going back and forth between bypassing it and putting in my adjustments and bypassing it. And and she could, obviously, because she knew I was doing it, but she could really hear how much it was affecting what she knew was her voice, which was, uh, which is pretty good, actually, because a lot of times... In my experience, people don't always catch stuff like that, you know, uh, from a mixing standpoint, other than turn my stuff up or turn it down or whatever. But, um, yeah, you have to be really careful and judicious about it when you're, especially when you're working with people in the room. So, yeah. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. (laughs) Yeah. One thing that I like to do is just hand the singer a 520DX and uh, then they're completely out of the mid-range out of the low range and they're only mm-hmm. occupying the upper end as an effect or sometimes depending on if the genre will allow it as just sort of uh this is what you got sort of thing oh. and yeah you can get some really really good results with that uh to, who makes that one sure sure yeah it's uh, the green bullet mic i'm sure you yeah i love that mic um th- that's another thing too about like the 58 uh it's pretty well genius for anything you know other than something that's got to be very intricate and classical sounding and um i don't know how many times i've tracked with a 58 in the room and it, you know ended up being the actual focal uh and it it's sort of built to have it has a, a bump uh in the mid-range anyway like where the vocal sits but um yeah tracking live with sort of a, a loud rock band i mean Every every song that you've ever heard that was a live version, or even on a lot of records, that that was the you know it was either Neumann U eighty seven or it was a fifty eight yeah. half the time on on major you know major hits. So I mean, if it worked for them, right? Um, so I always try to set it up to have it just in case. <laughs> um, and you know, and and a lot of the times, well, we've talked about this before too, but a lot of times the first first vocal take is the golden one anyway as long as the band got through it fine so yeah it's kind of interesting i was gonna ask you have you ever seen one of those reflection filters that they put behind the microphone to create sort of a semi yeah yeah i haven't actually used one and i've heard mixed um mixed results as to it being comb filtering and and uh, they seem to be very popular with like hip hop cats and stuff like that and I guess beats you know making a booth in the closet kind of a thing but which drives me mental anyway <laughs> I was just wondering if you if you had worked with any of those yeah I, you're getting into phase relationship stuff on the reflection and I mean that's you know if if you take the time to push it and pull it farther away and get it really dialed in for the effect that you want. I suppose it might be useful. Yeah. See, I know a lot of guys, well, it, well it's not a, sorry, it's not a reflection. It, it's a bad name. The, the company is called Reflexion or something like that. But basically what it is, is um, a little connection that instead of having a pop filter, you would have a, of course I had to pop my pee when I said that, but it, it, it's like a mini booth that comes off the back end of the mic, uh, the microphone stand and sort of curves around the mic. Yeah. The mic. yeah. So it, it's supposed to sort of. It makes no sense to use it in a vocal booth, obviously, but in a more live room, there's reasons why I could see it could be useful. Yeah, in in a live room, if you're tracking with with the, another band, totally. But every time I've ever seen those things in use, they always seem to be in use when there's nobody else in the room. And speaking of that too, like I know a lot of like hip hop guys will record uh, their vocals in a closet. Like they'll they'll pack the closet full and just make enough room for the mic and get themselves in and close the door. And which is, I, I'm guessing partially a monitoring thing when they're, they're, they're recording at home, but it's like the worst idea. They like singing through a sock really, <laughs> yeah. you know, like every time guys come into my studio to record hip hop, I have a, I have a drum booth and I have a big ass room and I put them in the big ass room like nine times out of 10. And, um, it takes them a bit to get comfortable because they're so used to being in a sock drawer when they're doing, <laughs> you know, the, the, but it's a huge difference vocally. Like you get. Yeah. So that, that high end, that openness is really, 
you know, because yeah. humans have been hearing each other that way for a million years or whatever, um, yeah. our brain likes it when that material is there. And when you get rid of it, you're essentially rolling off the high ends when you go into a closet to record like that. Um, you're, you're taking away all of the room noise and we like the room noise. The human brain likes it. And, and yeah, and like, and the, the snap of the room, you know, like I, I've done stuff where I'll track vocals, like verses in one room and choruses in the other room and vice versa. Um, but getting back to the, the, the closet sock drawer thing, not only will these guys record one take, but the, you know, they'll do three or four doubles on, you know, a vocal and they end up with this muddy, you know, over the top of the mic sort of situation that ends up happening. Like that's what it ends up sounding like is because there's no room. It's just so extremely direct. <laughs> um, did you, have you ever read much about Bruce Sweden? No. Nope. No, he's the guy that produced uh, a reasonable amount of Michael Jackson's records. And Maybe. on. Maybe. Yeah. He's kind of, he looks like he might be from the Ozarks. Like he, he's sort of this hick looking kind of dude. He, he's a genius of an engineer. Um, Did he have a tape op interview like three, four episodes or three, four editions back? Probably, yeah. We may have been having a brief discussion about him, but I was reading lately, not in that, but it was in another interview, um, that when he did stuff on a lot of the Michael Jackson records where you hear Michael Jackson and then you hear like a reverbed reflection of an owl or a ye or whatever it was that Michael would do, it was not ever an actual reverb. He would record michael singing line like singing a verse uh two feet away from the microphone four feet eight feet 16 feet away <laughs> to 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 actually pick up the reflections on purpose yeah to, to create natural reverb which is obviously when you have a big budget you can get away with that but he he did that stuff on purpose and you can hear it like it it's a double but it's not a double because a Michael was so good that he'd hit that same pitch every time kind of thing. But yeah, he actually recorded it to make it sound like reverb, but not actually digitally created apparently, which is fairly genius thinking all that kind of stuff out. <laughs> I just always thought it was kind of interesting. It's a trick worth remembering actually. So yeah. we're basically out of time, but, there was uh, two things that I wanted to mention before we finished up here. Um, one, if you guys haven't tried this, if you got a, a mic pointing at the front of a cab and you have one pointing at the back, listen to it in the monitors while somebody is playing and then move the one behind the cabinet away. Like while they're playing, move it away. And you will hear the frequency banding changing in the comb filter effect that you get from those two microphones that yeah i have actually done that before it's you can actually... tune it it's really cool i mean you may not use it but it just do it once because it's really cool to hear it's, it's a lot of fun and if for that matter we were talking about reamping you could always reamp something into an amp just just to dick around with that like record you know something through a di and then just have it on a loop so that you can sit there with headphones and move the mic you know yep. and the other one is um if you're more on my side of things and you do um uh sources that are sometimes things like pure square waves and things like that uh throw that thing through a bandpass filter and sweep it up and down while it's playing uh pierce square waves because they have so much harmonic content you can almost change completely the character of the effect that you're getting of the what instrument it kind of sounds like just by sweeping the uh, center frequency up and down on a bandpass filter and the effect is great so if you haven't played with that do that's a lot of fun i've done that on on lots of stuff um not specifically synth parts, but on other things too, as as an effect sometimes, and it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, the the more pure the waveform is to itself, the more 
um, the harmonic content is going to come out. Yeah. And this is all about harmonic content. So uh, because synths are so like just blah, this is a perfect wave sort of thing, which can be terrible or it can be beautiful. Uh, by throwing a filter on it, you can just absolutely control where it sits and what what it triggers in the human brain as to what it sounds like and which role it fills. So play with that if you you know if you get a chance or if you do that kind of thing. But we're like five minutes over, so we should probably stop. Cool, sounds good. That was a good episode. Yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, you guys can find this show every Friday at patchbay.tv. There's an RSS feed there on the page if you want to automatically download it. Uh, uh, iTunes, your phone, whatever. Uh, that's it for us. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>